So in the season of Easter, second Sunday uh, of Easter, uh, we, we meet the disciples once again, and they are uh, locked behind closed doors for fear of the Jewish authorities. Uh, they're scared to death. They're worried that the same thing that happened to Jesus might happen to them. Now, they have received word from several of the disciples and the women that they went to the tomb, and the tomb was empty. Now, we did the tomb was empty event last Sunday, right? Lots of rejoicing, celebrating, power of resurrection, looking at the tomb, no tomb there. A couple angels tell the women, why are you looking for the living amongst the dead? Jesus is risen. We threw out peeps. We had balloons. It was madness in here, right? Which is the one Sunday it should be madness, is, is, the, is Easter Sunday. But we continue in that Easter story, and we find that even though the tomb was empty, and that people came back to share with the disciples that the tomb was empty, they still had some doubts. And they were definitely wrapped up in their fear. Now, we sometimes can get a little skeptical and cynical about the disciples. Because we know the story. But they were living in it in the moment. And so after being disciples following Jesus around for three years, thinking that he was going into Jerusalem to take charge, and he ends up on a cross, and they see him die, and they see him being buried in the tomb, they know he's dead, that even though some who go to the tomb and say, hey, guess what, the tomb, we went there, we looked inside, his body wasn't there. And an angel appeared and said that he is risen. Even though they brought that story back to them, there still wasn't enough evidence, right? I mean, people don't rise from the dead. And so they find themselves in this room, locked in this room, because they're bound by their fears. Whenever I read that text, I, I don't know why, but this little saying always comes to mind. Meanwhile, back at the house. <laughs> and I think a, a part of the reason is that when, when I was growing up in the neighborhood, uh, we used to play outside. Uh, something that a lot of kids nowadays don't do. But the day when we used to play outside, and we'd run outside, and we had our little group of friends that we'd hang out with, and sometimes we'd think of something really cool we wanted to do, play football or wiffle ball or fly kites, whatever it was we wanted to do that day, we'd always go to try to find our friends to see if they wanted to do it with us. You, you remember, you, you've been there? And so we'd run around the neighborhood, hey Johnny, you want to come and play with us? And occasionally, one of them would say, no, I'm really not up to play today. And you're like, okay, come on, Johnny, we want to play. Well, no, 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 I'm just going to stay home. And whenever we hear that from one of our friends, we'd always go and play and have our event. We grew up in Point Santa Village, lots of fun things going on in Point Santa Village in the middle of Naples. And, and uh, without fail, somebody turned to me and say, you know, Johnny sure is missing out, isn't he? And somebody would say, meanwhile, back at the house, Johnny's being whatever we thought he was happening to Johnny, you know? <laughs> it's like this idea that something's happening, Johnny's a bit, and he's locked away because he's afraid of something, something significant. I, I was just thinking that. Or, or even I think about that meanwhile back in the house, like this is a sitcom that's going on, a TV sitcom. They've experienced this massive traumatic event through Jesus, hanging on the cross, death, burial, meanwhile, back at the house. Right? And so that's where we find ourselves. We find ourselves with the disciples today back at the house. And they're back at the house because they're afraid. They're locked in because of their, their fears. Don't they out there have fears? Another story that came to my mind, some of you have heard this story. When you're, when you're here for 20 years, you repeat stories, just so you know. So. When I was growing up, uh, early elementary school age, we lived in Moorhead, Kentucky. And I remember one day walking down the street to go meet with my friends again, you know, gather up the troops to see what kind of mischief we could get into. And one of my friends just had a birthday party, and he came walking out of his house with a Charlie McCarthy puppet. And, uh, and I saw the puppet, and I took off <laughs> to the house. I ran into the house. I closed the door, and I locked the door, and I pulled all the blinds down. And I ran into my bedroom, and I closed the door, and I hid in my bedroom. My mother was standing there. <laughs> and she was like, what the heck's going on? So she came over, and she said, bro, what's the matter? Oh, nothing, nothing. Just be quiet. Keep, keep the blinds shut. Don't answer the door. Because I knew they were coming to get me. She said, what's the matter with you? Uh, well, nothing, nothing. Just don't tell them. Well, I was afraid of that puppet. I, I don't know where that fear came from. Uh, it was Twilight Zone. You remember the episode? Actually, the puppet master. 
or he was having a puppet, and he'd always throw the puppet in the box, and the puppet was got offended. And so then one night, he goes to bed, he throws the puppet in the box, he puts a little lid over top of it, and he gets in bed, and all of a sudden you see the lid start moving over, and the puppet sits up, walking across the room. That's the moment. That is the moment. Terrifying. So I found myself locked in the house in fear. Well, anybody know I was there? My parents, in all their brilliance, figured the way out of that, and the way to remedy my situation was to buy me a howdy doody doll. <laughs> it was terrifying in and of itself. Oh my gosh, howdy doody doll. So I threw it in the closet. And the closet door was open. Occasionally in the middle of the night, I'd look up and he'd be looking at me. <laughs> but that's the kind of image, you know, this idea of being locked, locked away, locked in, or out of our fears. It reminded me of that story, that relationship. But you all have any fears? You have things that you, you confront in your life, maybe you feel like, like the disciples. So I close the blind, shut the door, lock, lock the world out. They find themselves locked in, in fear. A friend of mine, when I first went into ministry in Roxbury, North Carolina, served in a little local church, told me that, he said, Roy, you're going to meet a lot of people in the ministry, and every one of them have something in their closets. You know what I'm talking about? All of us. Raise your hands on their closet. <laughs> Something we'd rather lock in, rather than let anybody else know about, or let out. Another situation in Roxbury, North Carolina, I got to thinking about fear of being locked in, is that Leslie, my wife, was actually the, the president, the CEO of the domestic violence show there, safe haven of Person County. Uh, and just by default, because I was married to Leslie and I was in seminary, I was the chaplain of safe haven of Person County. I've had a lot of women, predominantly women, a few men, uh, who come to that shelter because they had been abused or were experiencing abuse in their life, both mental and physical. It's all around us, by the way. It's still going on. The statistics are staggering. There are people that are living under that, that horror, that terror, that fear. They find themselves locked in. And these men and women who would find their way to the shelter were courageous. And they, were, they were seeking liberation. They were seeking a way out of the place that they found themselves locked in. The really staggering statistic is that 90% of those who come to the shelter seeking some form of liberation and freedom in their life end up returning to their abuser. There are lots of people locked in in the midst of this world, locked in fear. And I got to thinking also, you know, if somebody's locked in, there are also people who are locked out. You got to think about what it means to be locked out. You know, I, I, we, we got friends, relatives, maybe even in our own lives, we, we find ourselves sometimes dealing with persons who have tremendous addictions. And we long so desperately to be able to connect with them, to find a way to help, but we can't get in. We feel locked out. It's not an easy solution. Sometimes families are dealing with others who have, you know, mental illness and those kind of situations, they, they don't know how to help. They feel locked out. Feel locked out. Even on a broader scale, I mean, I know in my own life, sometimes we talk about you know poverty in the world, we talk about the violence in the world, we talk about how Christ invites us to be peacemakers and to help resolve some of the problems. I mean, here at Cornerstone, when we bring up the offering elements, we get to the table. I say, we're in this working ministry yeah. for the. And then you sit back and you go, how is that going to happen? I mean, confronting some of the bigger issues that are going on around us, I mean, eradicating world hunger and putting an end to war, I mean, how can I do that? You know? And so I, I think that puts in place sometimes like we feel like we're locked out, that we don't have an easy answer, there's not an easy solution to those things that we have to face in this new world. We find ourselves sometimes locked in, sometimes we find ourselves feeling like we've been locked out. What's powerful in the gospel message today is that Jesus is never locked out. <laughs> they find themselves locked in the room for fear. And you know what Jesus does? He walks right through the wall. 
least that's my translation. He appears to them. Nothing can hold him back. And I use this language a lot around Cornerstone now because I think it's a beautiful image for us to hold on to. Is that you know our God meets us right where we are. There's nothing that can keep us from God. God will present, reveal, be with us, and come to us, even in the midst of our fears, even in the midst of our doubts, in the midst of our struggles. Our God is big enough to handle all of those things. And not even a wall can hold him back. And what's really good, tremendous, and powerful news in the midst of this story today is that Jesus has something to offer us when he appears. <laughs> he doesn't just appear to the disciples and go, Poo! you know, like, oh my gosh, you know, this really is real, you know. Like, no, he gives them something. He offers them a gift. And there's three things that I want you to hold on to today when you leave through this place as Jesus appears to us in this room, as we find ourselves in this place. The first thing that Jesus offers his disciples as they find themselves locked in, as he offers them his peace. He doesn't just say it once. He says it three times. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Now, if you read the Gospel of John, and particularly you go home and up this afternoon, read John 14. Because in John 14, we find a little bit more about what Jesus means by peace. He's letting his disciples know that, that this peace that he has to offer is a peace that goes beyond the understanding of the world. In other words, this peace brings us comfort and an understanding that our God loves us so much that even if we don't love ourselves, we can step into God's love and find healing and liberation and freedom. That it's a peace that's beyond the understanding of the world's value or definitions of peace. It's beyond the world's peace. And he offers it to the disciples by being present with them. Did you know that Jesus is present with you today? And that he speaks to the depths of our heart. Peace. Peace be with you. It doesn't just stop there. He offers us a second gift. He offers us purpose. The first words are, peace be with you. But the very next phrase, he says, as the Father sent me, so I... You don't know that line? As the Father sent me, so I... That's our purpose. What are we sent to do? Share the love of God with the world. We are, we are to become an embodiment of that good news peace for the world. We're, we're to... We're to live into this life in Christ through our prayers and through our worship and through our formation to get to a point where we become an embodiment of good news to our families, to our friends, to our neighbors, to our co-workers, to our community. And you know what? I can hold on to that. I might not be able to resolve all the world's hunger problems. I might not be able to figure out how to put in a war. I'll leave that up to God, right? But I can be an advocate for peace here in this place. I can stand for what's right in this community, amen? I can advocate for justice here in this place. I can help end poverty in Collier County, right? We can help end the housing problem in Collier County, right, Lisa? <laughs> we can do that together. We've got a purpose. As God sent me, so I send you. Jesus demonstrates the, what discipleship is through his life. How do you do that? Well, you offer yourself to others. And you find yourself surrounded by community that is affirming and encouraging in our life and our relationship with God. And we're set forth to share that love. And that's going to take us a lifetime to try to figure out what that love really means. I mean, it, but it's a beautiful journey, isn't it? I, I equate that, and, and I think it's a great image to share that with you a lot, those of you who've been around Cornerstone. For those of you who knew, this is a nugget you can take with you. I think it's a lot like marriage. And when, when Leslie and I first met, there was we were in love, and, and 
we loved each other, but that love looked different then than it does now. Uh, we've matured in love. We understand each other differently. Doesn't mean we're still not hubba hubba love sometimes. But there's a patient love, right? <laughs> She's much more patient than you. <laughs> but there's a beauty in that. There's a beauty in that growth. So to think that you're just going to accept Jesus and find his peace and that you're going to understand what it means to love the world, i got news for you. That's just the beginning of the journey. We're continually discovering what that means in the midst of our lives, in the midst of our community. And that's the joy of the journey. Amen. And the third thing that Jesus offers as a gift is power. But not power like dominating power. Holy Spirit power. This is John's Pentecost moment. We don't have to wait for Pentecost Sunday and for the readings and Acts. John gives them to us a little early, right? So he meets with the disciples. He offers them his peace. He provides them with their purpose. <coughs> and then he breathes on them. The very breath of God, the very power of God. We need to breathe in the spirit in order to live and embody this good news in the world. We can't do it alone. Amen? Amen? We can't do this alone. We need the Spirit present in our lives. I, I, I can't stand up here and preach every Sunday apart from the Spirit. And I'm going to tell you why. Because I don't always feel like preaching every Sunday. <laughs> and yet I've been called to that work as an elder in the church. Now, I'm not talking hierarchy. It's just what I'm called to do and be. And so when I wake up in the morning on some Sundays, I'm like, man, I'd really like to go to the beach. <laughs> Be with me, Holy Spirit. <laughs> when I find myself open to the Spirit, the Spirit gives me the power and the strength and the ability to accomplish that which I cannot accomplish on my own. Amen. Or the way I feel about it. This work's important. And some people get confused, too. They're like, how do we get all this? There's like some magic charm. Do I have to touch myself a certain way? Do I have to rub the Bible? You just ask. You ask for the peace of Christ to rest in your heart. And then you receive it. You trust Him. It isn't going to make everything magically better, but it's the beginning of the journey to experience the fullness of Christ in your own life and be able to see the fullness of Christ in other people's lives. And then offer yourself. Give up yourself and your time to benefit somebody else other than you. The Father sent me, I send you. You've got lots of opportunities here at Corner Room for you to serve and give yourself to somebody else. And we have to ask and pray to the Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Breathe on me. Breathe on our church that we may be an embodiment of good news in our community. Meanwhile, back at the house, <laughs> the disciples receive power upon high. And they go forth from that place no longer afraid. And they begin to change the world. To the glory of God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.